You're listening to the Forest School Podcast with Lewis Ames and Gemma Sutherland. Hello. Hello. We're back. We're back. We had more time off than usual for things. For things. I know. I was going to um, start by asking what day it is. What day is it? It's Sunday what? today. No, it isn't. It is. Uh, no, it's not. It's Saturday. <laughs> the, it's Saturday, the 6th of February. You are in Rivendell. <laughs> The time is 11.22, if you would like to know. 11.42? No, I'm joking. No. Is that a joke from something? It's me being a nerd and trying to quote Lord of the Rings. Oh. Yeah. Oh. You're not nerdy, I know. What? I mean, I would never say that. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's been one of those weeks. It's been a week. It's been a, it's been a week. It's been went, a week. Went to hospital for suspected appendicitis. Turns out it wasn't. Turns out I'm fine. That was exciting, you know. Um, a friend said to me today, um, "You uh, heard about your cry for help." <laughs> he said it with such a straight face. I was like, um, "Yeah." And he's like, "You know, you can just say if you need time off, just say." And I like reflected back on it, and I was like, "Hmm." Like, you know, I was poked and prodded quite a lot in the hospital, but there also was a side of it that was just really great. And I. <laughs> just- can I, I remind you as well, though, that the last podcast we recorded, you started with, I have that thing where I'd like oh, to be yeah. in an accident. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Do you think I should like say sorry to the NHS? Do you think I should write a letter? No, I wasn't faking oh. it. I was in a lot of pain and uh-huh. the doctor did check me out. Like I wasn't uh-huh. faking. I wasn't doing the whole like, you know, oh, I'm really ill. Although sure. maybe I was a bit psychologically. Sure. I don't know. Sure. But the things I enjoyed about it were... A, like watching incredible the people. I enjoyed about my NHS trip. Yeah, were <laughs> incredible people doing incredible stuff and just like getting on with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, and you just watch them, you go, fucking hell. Like, I envy you, even though I don't envy you. Like, I wouldn't be you, but I wish I was. Do you, do you, do you know what I mean about that? Like, really stressed out, really long hours. Like, they were talking about their 12 hour shifts and stuff and clearly looked like mega stressed, but still just like, getting the heck on with it and also that's the the time that I've been with the most amount of adults all talking to each other um in such a long time it's really fascinating to be there and they're all like colleagues and going oh yeah you know to watch the football and stuff I was like wow this is just a workplace that is carrying on yeah. albeit in like the most insane intense way for them um so it, that was nice to be with adults and talk to adults really nice clever nice people wow. okay. um um, it's been a less eventful week for me can I it. check in with my theme can I tell you what it's been a oh, theme yeah. for me so we have ticked over since our last um, recording we've ticked over into February and I did a sort of one month review and I was like do you know what I don't actually like journaling what? so I stopped so I stopped really? yeah <gasps> because I, I'm gonna I might come back to it but so here are my thoughts, and I'm sure there'll be lots of people who can resonate with bits of this. So my journaling was about gratitude and what have I been given and what have I given other people. Now, mm. I have no doubt that when we're back at work, I will have a myriad of things to think about. Um, and so I'll be able to write more yeah. things about shelter and about firewood and about food that I've been getting, you know, and... Mm-hmm. Um, play cues that have come from and and all that stuff will be there yeah and like Um, relationships with humans that aren't just your kids and your partner um so (laughs) what I found was one that it was quite difficult to some days I mean in some ways it was good to sort of be stretched and be like oh oh maybe I haven't been given anything today and then you think for a bit and you're like no I, I I have I've been given this or I've been given this so anyway but the other thing that I found difficult was I was doing it right before I went to bed um Mm -hmm. and uh I don't know about you but my sleep routine is like once I go upstairs my brain goes you are going to bed now right my my sleep no more jobs my no more jobs my sleep hygiene is so like uh I might watch one video on my iPad or something but it's not a time where like I have a chat and then we do something else and I think about this you know it's like you need to go to sleep and it was basically the book was sat on my bedside table like a looming job like you can't go Mm. to sleep yeah and also Mm. doing it at the end of the day I found quite difficult because 
if I got to the end of the day and I was like, oh, I was given, say it was a day when I went to the woods and I was like, oh, I was given shelter and I was given firewood and I was given um, paths to walk on and I was given uh, that little visit from a squirrel. And then, and then I was like, and what have I given other people? Oh, fuck, oh, I don't know. And it's yeah. too late to change it then. Mm. Whereas I feel like if I had done it, maybe uh, to do it effectively, maybe I need to like not write it down, but have like three alarms set in the day to mm. to give myself a cue in the morning in the middle of the day and when I go just you know when I'm winding down to kind of That's go hey maybe think about it yeah. rather than like it's essential it's well I suppose it's the difference between like coursework and end of year exam you know you can stuff it all up at the end of your exam and go I haven't yeah. given anyone anything today um, that reminds me though the way that you were talking about it, it reminds me of when we have reflected about reflecting with our yes. groups in the woods yeah. and how we shifted from just an end of the day reflection to doing little mini ones through the day with our groups at snack time lunch time whenever um and that's very similar isn't it because in the same way that we were talking about you know if something dramatic and potentially negative has happened in the day to dredge it all up at the end of the day when it's all been like, you know, moved through um, and you haven't got time to repair the relationships and that kind of thing. Um, that's kind of similar to what you're saying, isn't it? I wonder, um, like, does it have to be a, uh, what, what's the word? Like in some kind of yoga practices that you can do like in the morning, it's like, oh yeah, affirmations. Is that right? Or make like mm -hmm. no, an intention, make an intention for your day says Adrienne, the online yoga teacher. Um, I, is, that, is that different to what you're doing, like an intention? I guess it would more be like a plan of thinking, oh, one of the gifts I will give today might mm. be, and then it might make, make me think of like a more elaborate bit of cooking or it might make me, you know, it would yeah. kind of inform it, um, which I think I'm going to go, that, that will be my kind of like, what I don't want to do is just be like, uh, oh, I said I would write my journal at, at the end of the day. And so I must do that, even if it's not working, even if I don't like it, you know, it's like, yeah. okay, this isn't, just take a bit off and yeah. adapt it. How is your old worldy knowledge? How is my old worldy knowledge? Um, oh, now you're asking. I feel like I... you and I talked a lot about witches this week. Yes, I have been... Um... Well, have I talked on the podcast already about the, um, or told you about the amazing uh, medicine spoon project? No, have I told no, you about that? Um, I'll have to look up the lady's name, um, but she, I think, is an artist and she is running the medicine spoon project. I'm going to look it up as we're talking. <laughs> It is the Medicine Spoon Memorial Project um, and you can find out more at madeonthemoors.co.uk and um, this woman, I think she's called Karen Thompson, she is finding all of the names of women who were persecuted as witches mm -hmm. and she started off with names of women in Scotland and um, she, on a piece of white fabric, draws the outline of a spoon, um, like a medicine spoon, the idea being that these women who were persecuted for witchcraft actually were herbalists were people were like early you know um community doctors almost or nurses mm -hmm. midwives who knew about like the free medicine that was available and therefore like the only medicine that was available for poor people at the time um and then and she'll send you one of these blank pieces of fabric with a spoon on it and a name of a woman and she sends it out and i think you pay a fiver to cover postage and then you decorate it and embellish it however you like and you can embroider the woman's name on it or write it as a kind of memorial to that woman and then send it back and then she's making this amazing kind of artwork with these um, memorial spoons and there are just hundreds and hundreds um, and that's just in Scotland she's going to do the um, British one the English ones um, next mm. so I'm kind of really keen to get involved but something just struck me quite recently about how at Halloween we like dress up in pointy hats and you know our kids are like oh I'm a witch whatever mm. and actually that's kind of a bit like, like I'm not saying it's the same as blackface but it is like just re like a really weird thing to do when many people were killed in the most hideous way and persecuted um for no reason other than yeah they were the person who was a bit odd who lived at the end of the road or... they were challenging the patriarchy exactly when um, will you learn when yeah. will you learn no, I'm yeah. oh god so um yeah so i'm really yeah interested in that 
Um, and you've been listening to a podcast about it, is that right? I listened to, yeah, the radio for uh, Your Dead to Me podcast I've recently yeah. found and went back through um, and that was, yeah, was really, really good. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I said I had kind of had interest, I have interesting thoughts. I find myself feeling defensive whenever anyone talks about like a historical patriarchy and I'm not sure why I should feel defensive. And I just sort of check that um, that feeling and go like, oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Mm. That I feel that, and uh, you know, that I in some way feel guilty, not not responsible, but I feel like, mm-hmm. challenge- I don't know. So it's, it's yeah. an interesting thing to, um, yeah. Uh, to, yeah, to experience. Find out about CPD courses at childrenoftheforest.com. Check out the podcast links for more details. But kind yeah. of on the subject of challenging things, we said we would talk about a blog this week. A very, a, um, I would say, when I say the word blog, what I imagine is like, hey guys, here's my perfect coffee recipe of how to make a mug cake. But this is a serious blog. This is. Um, Do you mean like one of those um, blogs with recipes where you Google it and it's one of the things that comes up and you're like, okay, great, this looks like a. Th- easy three ingredient cookie and then you have to scroll through the whole person's like life story and the story of their dog and loads of photos and loads of clickbait before you actually get to the recipe which is like somewhere down the bottom and you're like have I got this wrong do you mean like that yeah yeah I would actually do you know what I if there's not a because some of them now have a button at the top that says jump to recipe and if it doesn't have that I'm like I'm not reading it I'm not scrolling I'm not doing I don't want to know about your you know London-based life where you went for a walk and you saw some grass and that was lovely Uh, get on with it all the ones i find are american oh really yeah yeah but american Um, i mean okay we've got a lot of american listeners i'm gonna make a a massive sweeping statement now do you get frustrated when you look (laughs) we're going on a tangent already you look at a blog a a blog recipe and it's like how to make like delicious um particularly you and i will look up a lot of obviously vegan recipes so you look up like delicious um pizza dough three ingredients and i'm like okay cool and you look up um ingredient number one pre-made pizza dough from your local like or it's like a special vegan cake step one get some yellow box cake mix i'm like that's not you've half the thing has been made your your ingredients (laughs) can't be like and it's from a thing that i can't get in this country yeah i mean yellow box cake mix sounds good it, it sounds great it sounds like american cooking is like pour a box in add some oil or some water and then like in back to the future you just ping and your food is done i don't know how cooking works over there here we have to grind our own flour we have to dig in the earth for cat no we don't um apart from we make <laughs> instant cake mix with lemonade over the campfire that's pretty ping and your food's that ready it's pretty ping i was working i was having a test this afternoon uh and i put a picture on our social media of a cast iron pan vegan brownie like cook in oh. the pan and so oh. i made it in my little like um i've got like a four inch cast iron pan so i made like a personal um <gasps> brownie thing but i'm up for scaling it up and trying this was thing. it good oh it was incredible it was, was it on the incredible. hop like on i mean on the campfire what like, so you what? do it so you do it over the coals and you just put a lid on it like on a cast iron pan but um i did it on the hob at home but yeah um mm. If you're if you're listening, go and look at our social media. Go and look at this brownie. Like it was incredible. It was as good as it looked. Um, we were actually going to talk about a serious Amazing. blog. Do you think we're we... ever going to get around to talking? <laughs> <laughs> We've got lots to say about it. Okay, it's really important. Oh, it is important. It's called "What Best Explains Children's Connection with Nature." And it's by Miles Richardson, who I'm ashamed to say I've only just come across. It turns out he's just like some kind of, you know, guru on this whole subject. And um, I did email him to go, can you please, can you, Mr. Richardson, please, can you come on, on our podcast and talk about it? And he was like, ha, ha, ha. it looks lovely, oh, but un- no. understandably very busy, I'm sure. Of course, he was like, entire- I get about 20 of these requests every day. And I was like, oh, oh perhaps, okay. God damn you for being so important um and other people knowing who you are that's annoying um so yeah he's doing amazing stuff and he works um at the university of derby and also has his own blog which is uh called something else uh findingnature.org.uk and he's on twitter at finding nature 
Um, but yeah, so the, the, the report that he was involved in compiling with the University of Derby um, is not open access, annoyingly. Mm-hmm. So you can't read the full report unless you've got access to, I want to say Sage, but uh, no, Liebert, blah, blah, blah. Um, but you can read this blog where he sort of skims over the main findings, doesn't he? Yeah, it's like slightly more than okay. you would get um, in an abstract. Um, yeah. But yeah, very good for obviously tempting you in to go, oh, that looks good. Maybe I'll I'll go and look at it. Um some things very interesting some things a little bit challenging to what we do some things um that kind of confirm what we know as practitioners um i'm just gonna look at my because i made notes guys guys i made notes for me this week um so the first thing that i made notes was like the surprising thing was that nature like number of nature visits were not correlated to nature mm. connectedness. Yeah. Um, so that, and maybe I need to backtrack in, in, in a way. So it was like they did an, an NCI, so a nature connection connectedness index, where they kind of they made up this measure of how you could decide who was, you know, four four points connected to nature, who was 10 points connected to nature, um, mm-hmm. which is a completely separate study, is quite interesting, but from the findings of that, for using that NCI, the number of nature visits not related to nature connectedness. That kind of struck me as just an interesting thing, isn't it? That it's not yep. volume. It's yep. it seems to be quality, not quantity. Yeah. But also that, but even that, um, so it says uh, about sort of higher lab- levels of neighborhood green space, were related to lower levels of nature connectedness. And also neighborhood deprivation was positively associated with ch- uh, children's nature connectedness. Yes, now I had some thoughts about interpreting that. Would you like me to wildly speculate? Go for it. So I was thinking about um, how do you define green space? Because I mm-hmm. think that's an interesting thing. So green space um, and a lot of what can be considered green space is uh, like farmland can be considered green space Mm. so green space is different to accessible nature yeah so i would say um in lots of our country because of the way um so you've been reading a different book about how britain has its kind of land owning laws we're a very litigious (laughs) historically a very litigious and land owning nation um and our right to roam and our freedom of access is is one of the lowest in Europe if not in the world um so looking out my window now I can see green space everywhere but I can't access it so I wondered if this um study sort of whether that was one of the holes in it was being you know children in the countryside might have green space all around them um but you you know if the local if the woods that you can actually go to is a car journey away because mm-hmm. things in the country are spread out, then that is going to, det- you know, um, negatively affect your um, nature yeah. connectedness. Whereas being in an, an urban environment, it's more conscious about putting green space within reach of everybody mm-hmm. um, or, or to, you know, to some extent, someone there is someone in an office is measuring, you know, oh, well that block of flats won't be, you know, will be a 10 minute walk from that bit of green space or will be a, eight minute walk which just doesn't happen in the countryside it's kind of taken for granted of like yeah yeah it's a it's big old village in the middle of fields it'll be fine yeah um and also i wonder if there's a thing about like um how you define nature connectedness so i think in order to look properly at the um nature connectedness index you'd have to read the whole study but if you think about like you're saying um looking at a green uh, field full of crops or cows um, is going to score you a lower nature connectedness um, level than interacting with some ants for a long time mm. crawling along the concrete in a park do you know what I mean that's like mm. a different thing isn't it so we might automatically expect nature connection to be about wide open green space but actually if you're looking at um, sort of uh 
linking with other species about biophilia then that can be as you say like a small back garden or a or a play area or a car park or a playground um yeah and and it probably feeds in to for um a lot of children where nature connections connect oh it's such a hard word to say <laughs> for me nature connectedness is probably lower for uh, the, the generation of children coming through school now than it was for children in say the 50s right oh, yeah. broad, broadly speaking yeah we know this from studies about how far did children roam we know this from you know how much unsupervised time do children have etc cetera, etc cetera. so if you take that you now have a generation of children who have a lower nature connectedness mm -hmm. um, than other generations have had before them is it a case of meeting them where they are um, in terms of uh, connections is, is better suited to an environment where there are one or two types of trees and one or two types of shrubs because it's been intentionally put that way rather than an overwhelming, you know, nothing, you know, sometimes I see children come to our sessions who can't name any trees. They don't know any tree names. They don't know any mm. plant names. And you get them in, in the woods and it's like absolute overload. Like it all just becomes noise of like, well, there's just green things, aren't there? It's all just wood or it's or it's all mud or it's all flower. You know, it's, it, it just gets grouped. Yeah. Whereas it's like overwhelming. Over, yeah. Whereas maybe seeing ants on the, um, on the pavement is so isolated that you can build a connection quicker yeah you can have that connection that you can't go uh, you know the, the example i always think of is like trying when we you um sort of any sort of bird song activities with kids are uh, is quite difficult mm -hmm. if there's more than one bird singing in your environment yeah you know, it quite literally becomes noise and you go can you hear the thing that sounds a bit like this but maybe like this but maybe they're going ba -da 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 -da, and they're going no, because there's 95 birds singing right now. Yes. Yeah. What are you, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I was interested in the um, the part about um, neighbourhood deprivation being positively associated with nature connectedness. Um, and then they're kind of speculated in saying um, that other researchers found that children in more deprived neighbourhoods spend more time outdoors with friends, maybe engaging mm. with nature while making dens or collecting the nat natural objects they find. So I can completely imagine that being the case and thinking about you know um where housing is more densely packed and people might um know their neighbors a bit better and you might have more children of a similar age living in close proximity together in a town that families are kind of more chilled out about their kids roaming around together in the park maybe even where the parents can see them out of the window mm. you, know, you know but they're there all day and that you're more likely as a child to engage and really connect with nature when you're in a, a small group of friends than you are when you're being briskly walked through some beautiful, glorious countryside with your middle-class parents. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that that's the real nature connection as opposed to the, the thing that we might imagine about just like, oh, nature connection is like visiting National Trust properties. Actually, is it really? Because if you think about the way that children develop and learn through play, they don't get much time to play freely and with other children that aren't in their family on your average middle-class family walk. Um, mm. And so you could argue that actually Forest School does support that kind of finding in terms of it being a bunch of kids in one place for a longer period of time where they really properly can engage. Um, and that's the kind of route in to nature connection rather than a more superficial uh, level. Yeah. Um, there was a sorry. Go on. No, I was going to say uh, that makes me kind of wonder whether it's it's something to do with um, how nature is presented. So you might have children who are um, at particularly here, say private schools, might go on more nature connected, nature themed activities. You know, more walks, more um, school trips out, things like that. But if their experience is like a didactic approach to nature you know you you should yeah. appreciate this um d don't do that because you know you you need to you need to focus on the leaf rubbing you need to do you know get your head down exactly do yeah then we're doing it, this study right now yeah yeah it yeah. kind of kills that awe and wonder 
whereas experiencing it naturally with naturally her huh, um experiencing like with your peers and sort of discovering things as your interest comes on and doing that sort of child-led nature connection you know that's mm. an interesting thing that they haven't talked about is whether the nature connection is child-led or didactic which i think could have a massive impact one way or the other support the podcast today by becoming a patreon member at childrenoftheforest.com check out the podcast links for more details yeah. the other yeah, it's kind of going back to that thing about like pulling the legs off spiders and, you know, pouring water on anthills and seeing what mm. happens. And um, that isn't, you know, you almost need the, as a child, you need the freedom to be able to experiment with nature in that way in order to connect with it, in order to understand it, you know, pull apart, go, oh God, I now have emotions about that. And now I care about it. Um, the interesting bit about um, children in more deprived areas tending to spend less time using smartphones, which is mm -hmm. predictive of greater nature connectedness. And um, I've enrolled on a free course at the University of Derby, which I've only just started it, but I would recommend if people are up for it. And if you um, look at this article, I'll, put, I'll try and put the link in the um, in the show notes, but mm -hmm. there's quite a lot about smartphone stuff in there, which is quite depressing. And it, it that, you know, there does seem to be um, great links between the amount of time spent on smartphones and smartphone addiction and a lower nature connection um, index. Mm, that's very kind of um, the zeitgeist at the moment, isn't it? I think a lot of people are wait, uh, maybe waking up is, is the term to um, what smartphones are and, and what they're actually doing to us. Uh, yeah in more than just the short term yeah um, it, there's a paragraph here that i was thinking about um which is so they found that one of the greatest indicators for nature connectedness in children um was time spent or proximity to a nature connected adult or a na an adult with high nature connection which is interesting from two points one that they possibly again it's behind a paywall and we I don't know the ins and outs of the study. So it would have been interesting to see if they had done us a, um, a, I don't know what you would call it, like a, um, some sort of check to see like, is it just a nature connected adult or is it a nature connected peer? Does a nature connected peer have the same impact on you as a nature connected adult? Well, from the study, it says it's quite specific and it says the, the most important um predictor of children's nature connectedness is having an adult with high nature connectedness in the same household mm. is their finding from this particular study mm. um so yeah it doesn't really go into detail about whether that's a peer it's more like in the same but that's, household. that's i think that's what i mean is is they obviously can test for how nature connected are the adults in your household whether they asked the children you know oh how nature connected do you think your friends are or even took a group of children you know mm. I don't know even whether they um tested for that is that the right way surveyed for that yeah um, screened screened for that yeah. there we go um but anyway so if we take that as a kind of a, a standing thing we have found that or this study has found that uh adults with a higher nature connection uh, lead to more nature connected children that makes me wonder then um and it kind of brings up a thing that I was thinking a lot about um, when we hit our first lockdown in um, last year, March last year. Jesus, what a time. It's a year gone. Um, we, there were lots of resources going out because everybody was worried about the children losing sort of outdoor learning and lots of people making resources for homeschooling that were like take your children out and notice this or take your yeah. children out and do this study um and one of the things that struck me when I was watching those things is like you know we've talked before about you have like a teaching persona you have like a, a leader persona that you go I'm not 100% honest I, I have some sort of um a bit of this is acting you know what I mean yeah, yeah. um but whether you can do that with nature connection because nature is so awe and wonder and um so broad that if you're genuinely not interested in it can you take children out and do a bug hunt if you if the only things you know are the three facts about ladybirds that are on this printout you've got and you have no further interest in it, in it as an adult can you actually lead that 
Um, yeah, well, that's kind of what the study's saying in terms of, um, so th- like two things. One that I don't know if it's in the study or on the course that I've started, um, it's kind of arguing that the um, nature, co- the level of nature connectedness um, in some places I think is beginning to be, but should be worldwide on the kind of index of well-being mm-hmm. and happiness. They think it's so fundamental to us as humans to being happy that they think it's got to be added to the, you know, the social, um, economic, all of those kind of factors yes, in terms yes. of assessing um, well-being and having a good life. Um, so there's that. And if we become more aware of that, then we as parents, as adults that work with young people in whatever context, um, kind of see the priority in that. So in the same way as if you were kind of being a good and responsible parent or um, youth worker or whatever, you wouldn't go, oh, I find maths really hideous. I hate maths. Therefore, I'm not going to ever talk about maths with this young person ever. You kind of put a brave face on it (laughs) if you hate maths and go, oh, yeah, it's really interesting. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's find out about this together, you know, and don't, um, uh, you know, try to terrify the child with your own hideous story of your scary maths teacher. Um, you know, I'm not speaking from experience here at all. Of course not. Um, no then, uh, <laughs> then you might go, okay, I really find slugs absolutely disgusting, but I'm going to hide that hatred because I know that nature connectedness is really important for your for your life as a child and your outcomes later on. I'm going to kind of hide that and make it a priority. So I think maybe if this these findings become more well known then more adults will have that feeling but also the study kind of says that at the moment we've been those even when we do accept that nature connectedness is really important both for um humans and for like the future of the planet because if you don't know about it and care about it then how are you gonna look after it when you're an adult and you can make decisions about these things Mm. um then all of the kind of like interventions as it were or projects have been aimed at children and have been through schools perhaps or Mm -hmm. those kind of things it's like oh yeah get children outside but actually we need to be targeting parents parents. and families and that's what we need to do and it's not just about getting it's a bit like how I always find it weird when schools really talk about healthy eating with children and how to like you know what makes a healthy plate and how to cook properly and stuff it's like you're telling like a seven-year-old this but they've got no control over what they eat you know so less control haven't they i guess the the dream is that the seven-year-old goes home and goes oh yeah we should eat more carrots i love carrots um but but that's just putting so much pressure like on the kid do you know what i mean it's just like almost kind of making like guilt shaming them or some you know do you know what i mean like worrying they go home and they have just got a plate of waffles because is that's what was on special for this week mm. like that's not fixing the problem is it i mean i could go on for bloody ages about that about food poverty and calories and shit yeah. um but that's maybe another another topic but um but yeah i found that really that's a kind of total total shift in the way of looking at it isn't it in terms of and it really made me remember times with our parent and toddler groups or family groups that we've done um, and those moments of nature connectedness with the adults and all those things which you talked about on the podcast before about the adults kind of going oh you know this is actually like really eye-opening because I joined this group for my child but actually I'm getting loads of that out of it or am I supposed to join in says the adult it's like of course you are like this isn't just for the children this is for you as well and now we've kind of got this evidence to sort of back that up yeah. um, and go this is actually really critically important and I was just remembering um again this study brought up that memory of um I don't know if you remember there was a time there was one session that we did with some adults and toddlers and it was kind of like a bug hunt but it was more like mindfulness we basically got them to we gave them magnifying glasses we said just like sit on the floor I think it was summer or the weather was all right anyway hmm. and just from where you are take a trowel and a magnifying glass and just sit down and just like stare at the ground and maybe move a bit of soil around move a bit of a leaf around move a twig and just have a look and um and some adults stayed there for ages and then I remember speaking to this one parent and she kind of like came up like looked up and her eyes just looked different she was just like wow that's actually really amazing isn't it I just saw loads of stuff and I just didn't know what it was and and I just like focused like looked at the ground for ages and I was like that the study made me remember that moment I was like well that is like a nature connectedness moment isn't it it's that mm. kind of stuff it's not as as you're talking about you know having a 
like, oh, what an amazing, beautiful view, or, oh, I've seen a very rare animal. It is just going, well, this is the soil I work on, I walk on all the time. And there's all this stuff like living Awe here. Awe and wonder, man. It's awe and wonder. It's oh all awe and wonder. It it's makes me think like about, um, we've had uh, uh, a couple of parents at, at sort of parent and toddler groups or at family sessions who have uh, more or less explicitly said, um, the kids are already great outside this is for me I'm here because I don't want to pass on that anxiety or um and uh I can think you know we've got some parents who have come and are now coming with their second child um yeah because they were just kind of like well this is for me you know it started being like well let's get the kids involved and now it's for me and now I'm you know they sometimes sort of go hey did you see me doing that and it's like like they're you know, a kid again going, did Lewis, did you see me doing that? Yeah. I never would have done that before. Isn't that amazing? Look yeah. What, you know, just so self-motivated and, and intrinsically motivated. I guess that's the thing is mm. um, I, I wonder whether those, I remember as a child going around lots of, um, like my parents were like, I think they might have been National Trust members or, or, or similar. And um I don't know if you did this, you go around like stately homes and they would give you like a, a, a cork clipboard with a sheet on it. And it was like, you know, questions like how many of the statues are wearing crowns? How many mm-hmm. of the doors have um, lion door knockers? And as mm-hmm. you go, it's sort of so that the parents can have a walk. And as a kid, you've got something to be occupied with. And now, yeah. you know, we do sort of similar things with like geocaching um, or... That, but I, I wonder, do those things in any way connect you to nature? If mm. Because the reward f- from memory was always like a couple of sweets at the end or like uh, yeah. a, a little, there was a, an external reward. So when you're going around, you're not actually engaging with the environment. You're just going, I've got to fill this all out because otherwise, and then you get to the end and the lady behind the um, gift shop till would just kind of go, well you've got most of them that's very good and we'll give you it anyway (laughs) that's our family every time yeah Yeah. yeah 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 i know i'm still looking at this bit of the study that's like the counterintuitive findings about the children from higher income households and low income fast, uh, lower income households because the higher income families spend more time visiting nature but there's no relationship found between nature visits and nature connectedness it's just so interesting well i had a thought about that which is very broad would you like to hear my very broad thought mm, yes, please. so i wonder particularly in the uk we have more of a um, we talk a lot about like social mobility, but we've still got a class system, let's be honest. Um, mm. Mm. And I think there would have been a thing where the, a bit like we were, t- so it kind of links to what we were talking earlier about um, people being accused of witchcraft would have been very strong in like herb law because mm-hmm. they would have been um, poorer people. They would have needed to get medicine from the the woods, from the shared land. Um yeah. And I wonder if there's something to do with if you are connected in a way where I'm going to try and phrase this very intentionally. If if raspberries on the side of the or blackberries from a bit of a hedge are a significant source of food or are like a significant joy in your life because you're not a family that can afford to buy blackberries from the supermarket every week. Mm. So blackberries being mm. found is a genuine joy um, mm. that will impact how you relate to those things. A bit like the marshmallow test. Mm. If you're a child who knows that mm. there's loads of marshmallows at home, can do whatever else, then you're not yeah. as tempted by that marshmallow. That's kind of what that study found. You know, more well-off children yeah, yeah. can resist that thing. Yeah. So similarly with nature connection. Um, and you know that thing about, oh, OK, I'm going on lots of tangents, but my brain is firing quite quickly. Um children who have grown up in like war zones or abusive families um like make better soldiers because they have like a heightened sense of awareness they know what they're looking for they apparently Mm. have a a better sense of like someone is moving in a weird way that person's gait is wrong so similarly 
does it stand then that if blackberries are a significant source of joy or food, or let's say um, mushrooms are, or mm -hmm. um, actually having shelter or firewood, or, you know, you spin these things out. Um, if that's significant in your life, your brain is wired to pay more attention to it. Therefore, your nature connection grows. Therefore, you know, it spirals that way. Yes. Uh and what about passing that on genetically? I'm just thinking. Uh, yeah, I so, was going to say that, but that's kind of more your, it's quite left field passing it well, on genetically. Well, it isn't, it isn't, it isn't, isn't it? Because it kind of goes hand in hand with what you're saying about, you know, um, uh, childhood trauma or whatever, mm. um, and that changing your personality, but then that actually being passed on to your offspring. Oh, what is it called though? Uh, epigenetics. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe maybe there is something in that idea and this is pretty yeah as you say left field of um people who did rely on the land for, mm. the, for their sustenance um passing that on epigenetically through the generations so maybe those of us who do just seem to have magically had a, a you know higher level of nature connection maybe it is passed down through our ancestors in terms of that awareness of of the outdoors and i think that's I, I think it's important to say that like when you're talking about this epigenetic stuff that that's not to say that this stuff can't be learned or it can't be mm. you know there's no we're not saying of course if your family are from uh you know if you can go on who do you think you are and you can trace back a very posh family line you're, ne <laughs> you're never going to be connected um mm. it's just about saying possibly people people's brains are naturally wired in different ways and mm. coming being in a lower social class therefore more reliant on common land on uh hedgerow foraging on um you know communal firewood those those sorts of things stay with you mm. yeah there's a bit in this blog that talks about whether um nature connected parents do different things with their families when mm. they are at a green space and it's, and they kind of predict that they do given that that's the biggest predictor of children's nature of children's nature connection. Mm -hmm. So what kind of things are nature connected adults doing in a green space with young people that instills that nature connection within the child? And you kind of think about that as a forest school leader, don't you, in terms of you're like a, you are a model you're modeling the way you react to things in the environment all the mm. time and you know and you don't you don't have to like fake that you just have it otherwise you wouldn't be doing the job you're doing but that's the kind of thing that maybe is rubbing off on the child it's the way you react when you see some slime mold <laughs> or whatever yeah. and that maybe that is what um nature connected parents do but also they could be doing things like you described like foraging so rather than we're just on a walk and we'll just walk and we'll we've got some really nice chocolatey snack bars in our bag which we're going to eat we're gonna not through necessarily need but oh we can eat these let's eat them um and all those kinds of things or having little stories to tell about the things that you're seeing that engage the children all the kind yeah. of stuff that you might do if you're a good school leader do you um, think sorry to cut across you do you do you think that um forest school in some way mimics being a historically lower class in that let me back it up in that mm. um the consequence for letting the wood get wet is that we genuinely can't make a fire we can't mm. for, for, for the most part if you want hot chocolate at forest school you you need you know we need to get a fire going we've talked before about there being sort of natural consequences at for a, a natural chains of events that you Mm -hmm. you, you can't fake and that's one of the things that um it's just sort of crystallizing for me now that when I do see um some settings that are maybe linked like a, an earlier setting that might be an indoor outdoor one mm -hmm. and the fire doesn't quite work so they just go in and they use the staff kitchen and they boil some water in the kettle mm -hmm. and then they bring it out and on one hand you can go you're just meeting the children's needs you're just getting those things but the other way are you losing something in terms of nature connection because you're not getting a cause and response mm. and where the forest school kind of you know I'm thinking about all the children that come and, and the children that come to our groups come from a, a lot of different um economic backgrounds um but at forest school 
nobody we're, we're all in the same boat when it rains it rains on everybody when it is windy mm. and cold it's windy and cold for everybody do you know yeah yeah So previous podcast guest Andy Smith is uh, on the 15th of March is running a, a virtual event called Supporting Autistic People in the Right Way um, by, with his company Spectrum Gaming. Um, it looks to be a really good event. Loads of speakers. Michael James is speaking, who was on, who's the author of Forest School and Autism. Um, lots of other speakers in there um, and kind of really bringing in that uh, saying of nothing about us without us, which is a way of saying if you want to um, improve your facilities or your sessions for um, autistic people then you need to be listening to autistic people and one of the things I think is really good yeah. about this event is that Andy has uh, involved some young um, autistic people to have their voice involved in the conversation and to have their voice kind of come through. Um, I'm going to be going, I'm going to be attending um, and I think it would just be a really good event for anybody um, who wants to involve the autistic community more in their session. So we will put the links in our show notes. Um, so just again, the event is supporting autistic people in the right way. It's by Spectrum Gaming. It's on the 15th of March. And all of the money generated from the ticket goes directly to supporting autistic young people. It does. Which is also great. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, it definitely harkens back to the past, doesn't it? And there's definitely something really like socially historical about forest school, I think. Yeah. Um, do you, would you say that your parents were very nature connected? Uh, no, but I think my grandparents, particularly my, on my dad's side, um, were, they were very, um, you know, they used to go, we used to go ferreting and put ferrets down rabbit holes and put, you know, we had to put all the nets on the holes. Um, do you know about this? Yeah. Thing? Uh, yeah. Um, that... Sort of vaguely. Not okay, really. so for, for people that don't go know, on, this is, uh, it's the practice where you, you work out where a rabbit warren is and you put sort of nets over all the entrances that you can see, uh, except for one. And then you put a ferret down that one hole and then you cover that one with the net and the ferret sort of runs around, freaks the rabbits out. Rabbits go hell for leather and they basically run into a net at the opening and then rabbit pie. Um, so we, you know, we would do stuff like that. So you go, used to do that I did with it your parents? I did it once, I think once or twice. It wasn't uh, like, that's what we do every week. Um, but I remember foraging in terms of like, for fruit and possibly I'm going to call it scrumping rather than stealing um, yeah. you know, for apples and stuff. And um, like just in terms of location, my granddad grew up in a village. Uh, well, you'll probably know it. Litchit. And Litchit Matravers. Litchit Matravers, right. This is how <laughs> we talk down in Litchit Matravers. Is that the uh, village of murders? <laughs> Well, it is the village of murders, isn't it? There's been yes. some freaky murders there. Yes. It's in a beautiful part of the world, though. Right. Let's, it's amazing. Let's dissociate my grandparents from the <laughs> village of murders, if we can. Um, my granddad did not leave the borders of that village until he was, I think, 10, and they got on a bus, right? Yeah. Like, like in terms of him knowing his locality, he yeah. would have known that place in an yeah. inside and out. Um but, but in terms of my family, no, I don't think we were. I would say we were more of a centre parks, you know, that kind of nature. Like, we'll go for a lovely bike ride. That's interesting, isn't it? Through the thing, so you think you know. it skipped a generation? I think I think it got slightly sanitised with my parents because they did economically better than their parents did. And so mm -hmm. that was the thing. And it was the 90s, man. What were we doing in the 90s? Just buying loads of stuff, yeah. buying shit. And yeah what about you do you think your games. family i mean you've talked about your um i'm gonna call them excursions in the woods um, <laughs> yes very very if you're looking at a kind of you know on a graph of you know averageness to very high mm -hmm. then um and i've only really thought about this since reading this study actually and thinking about the kind of 
real nature connectedness rather than time out time outdoors or going to fancy places in different locations and stuff yeah. they spent they both spent every day of their childhood that they could outdoors my mum basically lived in the garden for a while um and yeah my dad grew up next door to a farm we'd like rented a house so they weren't farmers but they lived on this farm and um and he had a very nature connected adult who kind of like mentored him and was really into birds so not only did he kind of try and pass that on to us but he told us all the stories about his own childhood and about getting up at dawn and doing dawn chorus thing and you know yeah. birding with this bloke um and yeah my mum just knows loads about wildflowers and plants uh, and butterflies and she doesn't necessarily do that much foraging or anything she's like it's not very trendy her nature connection if you know what I mean um right. but and she still is you know and she'll spend all her time that she can on her allotment which she grow you know she basically runs it for wildlife as well as growing stuff um so yeah and especially my dad was just still full of awe and wonder about it all he was just like this is amazing isn't it just all the time you know and I kind of sort of remember getting to a certain age and him going oh shall we get up and do a dawn chorus walk just Mm. you and me because you know you're old enough to get up at 4.30 4.30 in the morning or five o'clock now um, and feeling like really privileged to be doing that and it being really special and, and exciting. How old do you think you were at that point? Um, I think I was probably seven or eight. Okay. Maybe, maybe nine actually. Well, nine would tie in very interestingly with, um, there's a paragraph in here. Um, I was waiting to see when I could, when we could get to it. Cause I find it really interesting um, about the teenage dip Oh yeah. In, in nature connectedness with levels dropping by up to 30% from age nine to 15. So mm. that kind of, once we're getting into double digits and I find that interesting because in the UK forest school is, I would say very popular in early years. Mm-hmm. It's become a lot more popular in primary school, but I would still say there's an interesting kind of, and it's more of a systematic thing rather than a um, attitudes thing. I think one of the things about forest school is that uh, when you get to secondary school, subjects become quite segregated. Whereas mm-hmm. forest school being holistic in nature means that it can't be in lieu of geography and it can't yeah. be in lieu of science and it can't be in lieu. Of, so you've got to find somewhere to fit it into that. Yeah. Which is of, usually a kind of like intervention scheme of some kind, isn't it? It's for the kids who are, are struggling academically or emotionally or behaviorally. And so we'll whip you out of modern foreign languages and put you in a nurture group and we'll do mm. that outdoors. That t- tends yeah. to be what I've experienced yeah. before I was going secondary. But, it, but it's kind of interesting, isn't it, to, to think that if we're following this research, then either we are, as a, as a kind of society, n- nailing nature connection in early years and primary education, um, or y- you could look at it and go, young children are already nature connected. They, mm. they already find... Um, bugs and wildlife interesting and they already mm. love to climb trees we just sort of have to let them do it what actually needs some active work and some push you know some real kind of um, mm. energy behind is this kind of preteen to teenage thing yeah uh, it's sort of uh, where we're going okay well that's the point where it all drops off so that's where the the groups need to to be focused you know I'd be interested to know more detail about the study there in terms of when that started. Like, has that always been the case? Obviously, they haven't been doing this Nature Connection survey for, uh, you know, since the 50s or whatever. Yeah. But um, is that since records began, it's always shown that trend or is that increasing or what? Because that would correlate with smartphone use, wouldn't it? Definitely. Mm. Um, which we know lowers Nature, nature Connection. Also, in terms of... of the way that we're kind of wired as humans, you might sort of argue that at that time of life, you are looking, instead of understanding the kind of environment and the world around you, you're kind of honing in on like social relationships. And that's your kind of learning focus 
not yeah. not intentionally but just that's what you're driven that's your driver is like okay what what tribe do i belong in who are my real friends what what does friendship mean um what do relationships mean all those kind of things and those kind of things that our brains might be geared towards are more supported with smartphone use aren't they that is the absolute like uh I'm kind of I'm, I'm I'm putting my hands together in a kind of interlocked way, um, the smartphones and that drive for social interaction and yeah. belonging. In which yeah. case, how and would you design a program for prioritizing nature connection for that age group? Like, is it for a school or is it something a little bit different? Well, I've kind of always looked at that kind of thing as um, because the need for for social. Um, engagement is so strong at that at that age that it's sort of a self-fulfilling prophecy of like people then ch- children then go wherever children are so when everybody was out in the road playing football um then you you would fulfill that need to socialize by going out into the road mm. or by going into the woods and seeing your friends there but now that you can but then that limits who you can socialize with because you can only socialize with the people that are there at that time which is and a whole nother thing about kind of um, transitory nature and, um, you know, the, the sort of being in the moment, because the flip side is that you can stay at home and you can communicate with 300 people from your bedroom. And if yeah. you have a strong social desire, do you go to the woods and do quality with five or six friends? Do you stay at home and do quantity with your favorite YouTubers? You know? Yeah. And also I'm just thinking, thinking about it the way that you behave in around other children changes right because when you're a kid you're playing and you are playing in that free play whatever bonkers thing happens happens and through that we go oh there are slugs in this place where I'm doing my bonkers idea I say bonkers in that really affectionate I love play way obviously um whereas when you're 14 you're not going to be doing that like you don't play anymore you play in that different way um so you can't necessarily expect a bunch of 14 year olds to like you know say 15 14 year olds in the woods to engage with nature in the same way as a bunch of nine-year-olds or three-year-olds i'm just reading some stuff which i'm actually going on a kind of slight wiki hole as we are talking so i was looking at this study um as you were asking when when was that data taken so it was Mm -hmm. a it was a one-off snapshot of people from um nine to uh no i think from let me have a look from seven up to 95 and they asked Mm -hmm. and they scored all of these people in one snapshot of how nature connected they are and then sort of put them all in a line and you know the 13 to 15 group is the lowest group by far Mm -hmm. um which i'm then looking it goes up again and then it slowly comes up again um Mm. further down in this article they're then saying about how uh drop in nature connection cannot be solely addressed by occasional educational programs though given the climate emergency Mm. the solution needs to be a core and everyday topic delivered within greener school grounds and then it has hyperlink here uh, designed to create habitats for connection, which I was really then interested in thinking about how are green spaces designed at school? And they, in my head, they're either designed for completely flat so that we can play a large ball game, rugby, mm-hmm. football, um, something like you know, anything like that. But they're not really designed for, if we think about how do we design spaces at forest school for connection, it's little hidey holes. It's mm. spaces where you can feel um sort of secluded it's spaces where you can um move from one area to another you know we talk about um if you look at the opal um sort of guidelines they talk about having an activity and then the journey to the next activity being an activity in itself you know being yeah. logs or like a on. location yeah yeah, yeah. between locations a, like it, fun it's journeys. not just a, a flat yeah fun journeys that's a good way and if I think back to all of the schools and playgrounds and outdoor areas that I have seen they e- the the woodlands that schools have got or if they're lucky enough to have a woodland are amazing for that but they're often not allowed to use that during break and lunch time yeah. and the areas that they are allowed to use particularly my experience of secondary schools um both as a student and as a teacher um is like wide flat open space if you want to sit down somewhere sit in the middle of the grass or sit on the edge of the grass you know yeah 
And it's all about supervision as well, isn't it? It's about like, you know, you don't yes, want absolutely. little hidey holes where people can be bullied or get up to mischief. You don't want to trust the children. You don't want to trust those children because, no. you I know, they'll betray that good. trust in a second, you know. Yeah. Um, and heaven forfend, you have more people supervising at those times. Mm. Because that's well, when you need the most support. Or even just, you know, I mean, we could go off on a whole tangent about unsupervised time and how important that is and character defining and all these things. But um, there is something, isn't there, about if if the um, need for connection is strongest in the same age group that is having a dip in nature connectedness, then we need to think about how can we facilitate both of those needs at the same time? How can you meet nature connection? Uh, sorry, how can you meet um, social engagement through nature connection or alongside yeah. nature connection. I was also just thinking about children's mental health and um, what the kind of situation is in terms of which age groups are really struggling at the moment and whether there's a correlation there as well between sort of mental health issues in that age group and therefore nature connection being even more important to prioritise for those young people um, in terms of supporting their mental health and how you might go about that. I was thinking about um, my own childhood at that point and thinking about, okay, so was I nature connected 15 to, you know, 13 to 15? And I do remember really um, getting a lot out of, um, there was like a local group, they were like a wildlife group or local history group or something, who found this old abandoned mill in the countryside near where I lived. Mm. And they decided to, to restore it and so they asked for volunteers to do bramble bashing for clearing loads of litter out of the water course um all that kind of stuff and you know habitat um building and things like that and i bloody love that and we did that kind of maybe three or four weekends you know on a saturday all day and that was really fulfilling in a different way to the way that i might have just gone out and free played in the fields and hedges when I was younger, hmm. that kind of thing of working in a group with other people my age. And it, was, it wasn't it was like a youth project. It was just families. So there were some couple of kids my age. It was just a chain age. gang, wasn't it? This was when yeah. you were in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Child labour. Um, no, there were adults there, loads of adults that I'd never met before, uh, younger children, children my age. Um, and it was a kind of, yeah, community event. And there's no doubt that that did support nature connection for mm. everybody involved because you're giving back you're doing that thing of going oh yeah you know and, and I think we had like a there was one person who really knew what they were doing and were going okay the reason we're doing this is because blah if we if we um change this habitat these are the species that are going to grow or live here um so you had that awareness while you're working so I think that supported it. Being in Venture Scouts, well, that was a bit older, actually. That was, no, I guess I started that when I was 15, 16. So maybe a little bit older, but that definitely supported it. Um, but it's like a different thing. Do you know what I mean? If you were going to try and engage 13 to 15 year olds with nature, maybe there needs to be, Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's one to, that would be my kind of, uh, my closing thoughts on um, this blog is like, I'm really interested to see what organisation, what different organisations can do with this information and this kind of, because they're pulling a lot of, um, uh, a lot of studies together here to kind of make one sort of point, um, which I guess is the, the idea of academic research in general, isn't it? Um, mm. But I'm interested to see who uses this blog and who uses this study to inform their um, groups and activities going forwards. You know, I think it, mm. it, it could be very interesting to see what, what's done with this information. Yeah. yeah. In terms of forest school, it kind of has made me reevaluate, as I said, having those memories of the moments with our um, adult and toddler groups and, um, and reevaluate the importance of those mm. because I think probably on the one hand for a lot of forest school folk that might be the kind of thing you start with perhaps yeah um but it was also definitely one of the things that makes the least money um so one might be tempted to go oh, okay well you know that's the thing that's maybe I don't know it's a short period of time isn't it it's not like an yeah. all-day thing it's not like a holiday club it's not going to put in necessarily as much money or maybe you might kind of uh, dismiss it slightly in terms of its 
possibility to offer nature connection because it's generally you know two hours at the moment at the most isn't it yeah. we've got little kids in the woods with their folks their adults um but kind of making you reevaluate that and go actually no that is really important and those moments of adult nature connection um even if somebody only comes for a few months could have a huge impact on that adult's life mm. and therefore that child's life and yeah. make them see nature in a different way um, yeah, saying, saying kind that of is kind of uh, uh it's it's linked something in my head which is a, a topic that comes up a lot in forest school and i think may even have been the topic of our very first podcast um, adults in forest school adults in for well yeah which was seems absolutely ages ago now but if i think about uh, so if I now look at this and go, okay, the, the best thing I can do for nature connection for my group, let's say I'm arriving in a school um, and um, I'm going, right, nature connection is my goal here with this, this group of children. Um, and you get that thing that lots of people will have had experienced, which is where you have an assistant or a teacher that comes out or a TA that comes out and they are not nature connected. Mm-hmm. Um, and people kind of go, oh, how can I involve this person? How can I... Um, get them to kind of follow what I'm I'm going for how can I do it but it'd be very interested wouldn't it if you reframed that in your head in into how can I turn that teacher or how can I turn that TA into a nature connected adult Mm. what can I do to spark awe and wonder in that person so that they can then just go off on their own that reframes it totally doesn't it so that you're not going how do I yank them into line with me Mm -hmm. it's how do I get them to be a nature connected adult yeah or how do I get away with doing what I want to do with the kids despite that adult? How, How do, do I, I <laughs> occupy them with something amazing so they can piss off over there and mm-hmm. I can do the, yeah. But do you know what I mean? That is an interesting reframing, isn't it? To kind of think if we're talking about, you know, parents at a parent toddler mm-hmm. group thinking, okay, any adult that comes, if a parent comes to your school group session, if a TA comes to your school group session, they are in some ways as much of a linchpin as you are now mm-hmm. because they can yeah. either, massively help or they can undermine what's going yep. on cool well mm. I think we'll leave that one there we've waffled successfully I, about that I've one. really enjoyed that though man I had a real geek out that I really enjoyed that deep okay right we'll see everybody next week yeah bye bye uh... if you like this podcast and want to support more episodes you can donate through Patreon Visit patreon.com forward slash children of the forest to show your support for the Forest School podcast.